So we're actually looking at from chapter 12 through to chapter 14, or at least some of those. And there's three incidents which we're going to look at in the life of Abraham. Um, but this, that's the middle one that we've just listened to just there. Uh, youth, good to have you with us. Excellent, thanks for joining us. Uh, Brandon, did you have some sheets for them now, or is that for later? Yes, I will be with Do you want to go hand, hand, hand out now? That'd be great. Um, just to say, so we're encouraging some of our youth as they're here to kind of scribble down some notes as they're going along. I find that quite helpful for me. You'll know what your own learning styles are. But if we want the Word of God to change us, then we need to do whatever it takes for us to engage with that. So if that is just listening for you, and you're one of that, what's it, 15% or something, according to various surveys, who just listen and take it in and that's all, brilliant, that's great. If you want to jot notes on your phone or on a piece of paper or something, brilliant. If you're a kinesthetic learner, I, I don't really know what to suggest. I mean, <laughs> if you want to sit there fiddling with something and playing with something, but whatever works for you. I try to make things a little bit interactive, but it is always a bit of a stretch to, to make everything interactive. But do do whatever it takes for you to internalize the truths of the Word of God and then live them out during the week. Uh, just a quick start of this. We're, we're looking through all of this, and in, in everything we do, we're looking to glorify God, aren't we, really? We want our lives to glorify God. And I was reflecting this week, there's different ways that we can glorify somebody. Um, you might be aware of the Queen's Commendation for Bravery. It's a series of awards that are given out each year. Uh, the idea was that they realized there was very little by way of awards for civilians. This was during, I think, the Second World War. And they wanted to be able to award things to civilians that were just short of, you know, some big medal, but still wanted to recognize bravery. And so every year there's these commendations for bravery and a special medal for bravery. And uh, here are some examples from 2021. A chap called Sean Randall worked for the Leicestershire Police. Um, he was uh, out with uh, his colleague in a squad car, and there was a huge explosion and subsequent fire in this building. They thought something had actually hit their car because they were close enough that the car shifted sideways from this explosion. And without hesitation, they turned the car around, got out, and they ran towards the explosion. The first thing they saw was a, a man who was trapped under some rubble, and this chap, Sean, organized a, a rescue effort, got standers by, uh, passers by to, to come and lift things off so that he could get out from the rubble. And then he pressed on into the fire and found that there was a young man who was trapped underneath, uh, and they weren't going to be able to just you know, coordinate people around. The fire was getting big, so he directed the public back while he crawled underneath and rescued this man and dragged him back out again. Now, in that case, you can see that the victims, the man who was trapped under the rubble, the young man who was caught inside this building, they glorified Sean Randall through their weakness. He had courage and bravery and a self-sacrificial attitude, but you wouldn't have seen it if it hadn't been for their vulnerability, their weakness. So their weakness showed his character, demonstrated his character, and thus glorified him. Another example, Robert Carr from the National Crime Agency. They were doing a, a weapons bust. They believed there was a weapons factory or maybe just a big trading uh, sort of building where, the, where weapons were being traded. He was there on a motorcycle, and two suspects, there were shots fired, and two su suspects ran out of the building on foot, uh, and the people who were chasing them on foot were clearly not going to catch them. He was traveling the other direction on his motorcycle, hopped up onto the curb, stuck his leg out, and managed to trip one of the guys, but in the process fell off the motorbike and broke his leg. So at considerable cost to himself, but the suspect was apprehended, was found to have a loaded gun on him, which it was likely he would have used. They then shut down what turned out to be a weapons factory. In that case, it was actually the criminal's wrong actions, which showed the character of this chap, Robert Carr, the policeman in that case. It's interesting that, isn't it? Not that you would promote what he did, and yet his sin demonstrated the, the righteous bravery of this policeman. Interesting. Now, all of these awards are given out by the Queen, and that shows a third way in which we can honour people. She uses her status as the Queen to honour these people. If I did my bravery awards, nobody would care, would they? But when the Queen gives out bravery awards, people listen. And she uses the status she has to elevate other people and to recognize what's in them. And we see all three of these things in the life of Abraham as well. We see times when his weakness shows God's strength. He's not unique in that. Paul talks about that a lot, doesn't he? 
We see times when he is unfaithful or sinful, and yet God's character comes out even more strongly. Not that we commend his activity, but we see that it still glorifies God because of who God is. And sometimes he uses whatever God's given him, his wealth, his status, his power, to lift God up and glorify him. And we listen to him because he's Abraham. And people at the time listened to him because he was Abraham. And so those are three ways in which Abraham's life glorifies God. We want our lives to glorify God. As we look at these incidents in Abraham's life, these events, let's think about how that uh, gives us a window on how we can glorify God as well. Last week, just to frame this, Tim mentioned three promises that were given to Abraham. Quick show of hands, who can remember what were those three promises? There were sort of three headings that encapsulated them. Samuel, give us one of them. Land. Land. Okay, absolutely. There's a promise of land. Yep. Descendants or people. Yep, absolutely. Land, people, and what was the third one? Blessing. Yes, very good, iPhone. You weren't even here, so people do listen on the recording. Brilliant. Good to know. Land, people, and blessing. Those are the promises that we're going to bear in mind as we read through this. How does God's faithfulness work even in the midst of these events in in Abraham's life that sometimes challenge those promises? In the process of that, we're also going to look at three battles that we face. And these bits of paper here, so that we have them as reminders. I thought you might appreciate something that wasn't a PowerPoint. So we're going to look at three battles that we face in order to glorify God. So the first incident in Abraham's life There's a famine in the land, and he travels to Egypt. Now, there's food in Egypt, so it makes sense for him to go there. But when he arrives, he thinks, well, look, Sarah's beautiful. She's my wife. People might want her. I'm in the way because I'm her husband, so they'll kill me so that they can have Sarah. So he says to Sarah, look, can you just pretend you're my sister, please? Well, she actually is his half-sister. But he says, look, just just pass yourself off as my sister. (laughs) Yeah, okay, you can, you can deal with that one later. <laughs> Got any questions about that? Ask Brandon. Um, he says, look, just say you're my sister, everything's going to be fine. That way they'll treat me well because of you. Um, great attitude there being shown. So this is really odd, isn't it? Because th- then what happens is Pharaoh does indeed take her in to live in his palace and uh, God rebukes him and basically <laughs> he, 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 even though Abraham won't stand up for it, he stands up for Sarah and, and prevents Pharaoh from having any relations with her and returns her to Abraham by rebuking Pharaoh himself. Now we know at this stage that Abraham trusts God's promises because he's already left land and security and family to go on this huge journey, like minimum 1,200 miles, probably considerably more than that if he didn't go in a straight line the whole time. And so he trusts God and yet he comes into this situation and he doesn't trust. And What makes that difference? Why does he go on this huge 1,200-mile journey because he trusts God, and yet he comes face-to-face with Pharaoh and the prospect of rivalry over Sarah, and he doesn't trust? This is the first battle I want to look at, and it's because he fears. Our first battle is fear versus faith. There you go. You can see that one over there. Fear or faith. You can pretty much divide Abraham's life up into good episodes and bad episodes based on whether he fears or whether at least he acts on that fear. Has anyone here seen the the film Dune that's just come out fairly recently? A few of you. Okay. I've read the book. I haven't seen the film yet. But there's this mantra that comes out throughout the book. Fear is the mind killer. And it basically, one of the things that this boy, Paul, who's uh, the key character in it, one of the things he's raised on is if you live out of fear, you make poor decisions. Well, it's partly true, but actually probably more than that. Fear is a soul killer. Romans 8 pits it as totally opposed totally opposed to the love of God. Fear and love, they're, they're, in this sense of fear at least, living out of fear is totally opposed to living out of a loving relationship with God. And this is the battle that we always face. Because I don't know about you, but I feel that like I'm constantly bombarded with fear. As a household, I get insurance advertising through all the time. Has anyone here had Thames Water uh, advertising for insurance? You know, have you had, might you have burst pipes? It's like the fear-mongering central, isn't it? 
you know, it would cost you £7,000 if you had a pipe rupture under your house. Did you know that? It happens to 23% of households. And when they do, they aren't insured. And it just goes on and on and on, sort of makes me afraid that something is going to go wrong and I won't be covered and I'll have to pay large amounts of money. It's advertising based entirely on fear. My recollections of my teenage and student years, and in fact also being a student worker, was there was so much pressure to be in a romantic relationship and for that romantic relationship to quickly become a sexual relationship. And that fear was all about you'll be left out. You don't belong because you're not doing this thing that everyone else is doing. And if you don't get together with somebody, then all the people you might like would be snapped up and you won't meet anyone and you won't be happy if you don't date someone. And there's all this fear around relationships and it can cause us to make poor decisions. Look at the reporting on the Ukraine at the moment. That's a really significant world event, but even when there's nothing to report, there's always something in the news, isn't there? There's always something, some, somebody said one thing, which actually has very little effect on the overall situation, but it, it's another opportunity just to turn the screws of fear, because fear sells. So we're constantly under pressure to fear. Now, ignore for a second whether some of those fears are well-founded, because sometimes they are reasonable things to be afraid of. But the point is, if we make our decisions, if we live our lives based on fear, I'm talking here something different from fear of the Lord, which is in some ways a very different sort of fear and certainly pointed somewhere different. We make bad life decisions. We don't live in a way that glorifies God. We sang this morning, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness Jesus blood Jesus what he has done for us his sacrifice that is the foundation of our life not fear of what might happen to us God who is the very foundation of the world describes himself as love God is love if anyone lives in love they live in God and God in them so the best basis for making a decision is God his love his right standards the way he made the world so that's our first battle that we face every day, fear or faith. How do we live in a place of faith and not a place of fear? Abraham, faced with Egypt, chooses fear. God still glorifies himself, but not in the way that Abraham would have liked. And not in a way that we would commend ourselves. But we need to live in reality. Sometimes those fears, those things we're afraid of, do become reality. It's not as though you trust in Christ and then nothing bad ever happens to you, is it? So what of the times when we don't see those promises of land and blessings and people? What of what those times when we don't see those happen? What about homeless people and refugees who have no land? What about the orphan or the widow or the person who has longed for a long time to have a husband or wife and has not met somebody and therefore feel as though they haven't got people? What about the chronically depressed who might feel like they don't live in God's blessing? We need to be real about that, don't we? We need to look at the reality of the world around us. Because if we look at these promises that God made to Abraham, on the face of things, they don't necessarily seem to have actually been borne out, do they? God says, I will bless you. But what's the first thing we see happening here? Abraham lives through a famine and has to leave where he was planning to live. Doesn't immediately seem like blessing, does it? His herdsmen quarrel with those of his close relative and they have to part ways. Doesn't immediately seem like blessing. So he's repeatedly made wealthy, he's repeatedly vindicated in battle. There's definitely blessing there, but it's a bit of a mixed bag, isn't it? He might say, hang on a second, God. You promised me blessing and now there's not enough food where I'm living. You promised me blessing and there's this tension in my family because of sort of there not being enough grazing for all of our flocks and herds. Later on, there's this strife in his family. <laughs> And that takes us on to the people. This promise of people, he could say, yes, but it's a long time coming before he even has a child. And when he does, his first one doesn't count towards the promise, as it were. It's only Isaac that counts towards the promise. He has eight children in the end, after he's married Ketera, but only one of them is a child of the promise. This doesn't seem like the beginnings of a great nation, does it? He's one man. He has one child who's inherited this promise. He could say, God, really? Like you've, you've not even started down this road of making me a great nation. 
and land, where he's promised all the land he sees. And later on, God ups that again and further and says, you'll have everything from the Wadi of Egypt, which is either the Nile or a brook on the border of Egypt, we're not sure, all the way up to the Euphrates, which is a promise that's only fulfilled in Solomon's time. And even then, he doesn't actually own the land, Solomon. He, those those te territories pay him tribute, and in some ways he's ruling over them. And, but Abraham could reasonably look at this and say, I, I, I had a cave by the end of my life in the promised land. Have you really answered this promise? God, does God deliver on his promises? It's a big question. Does he deliver on these promises? We need to ask the question. Well, I want to, you to imagine a situation for a minute. Imagine Elise's birthday is coming up in March. So imagine that ahead of his birthday, I say to him, Elise, I'm going to make your birthday really special. Okay, it's going to be a fantastic special birthday. Two years without a birthday party, it's going to be great. And then imagine he wakes up on the morning of his birthday, goes down for breakfast, and I'm not even in the house. I'm not there for breakfast, I'm not there for present opening. And he might reasonably go, well, he's breaking his promise, isn't he? And on the one level, that would be fair. But knowing what we know of each other, I don't think that's what he would say. I think what he'd say is, he must be off preparing something pretty special, otherwise he wouldn't be missing this. Now, if God promises blessing and then we live through hardship, how much greater must that blessing be if it's worth going through this hardship for? This is what Abraham does. You see, this, this battle that he has is now versus eternity. I'm going to rip this on time. There we go. He sees the now, and it doesn't look like God's promise is fulfilled, but he looks further. He looks ahead to God's future faithfulness, God's future fulfillment of the promises, and he trusts him. Lise could think I'm just being a rubbish dad, but he probably wouldn't. He'd probably say, oh, he's probably off preparing something great. Abraham looks to the future and he says, God is preparing something great. Now, we're not just reading something in that's not here. This is all in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 talks about all these heroes of faith. And what it says about Abraham is, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were the heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham thinks ahead to God's coming promise. He doesn't grasp it fully. Abraham wouldn't have been able to sit down and tell you all about everything that we read about at the end of Revelation, this incredible heavenly Jerusalem. But he glimpses it the same passage Hebrews 11 talks about, these people seeing things, glimpsing it from a distance and trusting. It's when he fails to think about God's future fulfillment that he messes up. We think about when he takes Hagar and sleeps with her to have a child because he can't have a child by, uh, by Sarai. He's, he's taken his eyes off the future promise and he's just focused on the now. We have that battle as well, don't we? We have that battle of, are we going to think about the immediate? Are we going to think about my life now and whether I feel sufficiently blessed and whether I have what I think I need? Or are we going to really have our eyes fixed on future, on the eternity that God has ahead of us? Because all of those promises that God made are fulfilled in the most beautiful ways in the future. So the first promise, the, the promise of land, we read in the scriptures, don't we, that God has prepared a heavenly city for us. That city has got aspects of city, it's got people living together in harmony, all centred around God, God there with them, but it's got aspects of the countryside as well, it's got a river flowing and it's got trees flourishing, and however metaphorical or literal that is, this is a picture of everything that's good about creation and nothing that spoils it, all together in one place and people gathered in harmony. This is incredible. That promise is so much better than any country on earth being given to people. And the promise of people, we get to live a little bit of it now in the church, however imperfect we feel it is sometimes when we gather together. But the future is everybody, all tribes, all languages, gathered round the throne, worshipping God together. And we won't have any difficulty understanding each other. 
We won't have any of these cultural clashes that cause us to disagree, and there won't be any of the enmity that comes from past conflicts. We won't be divided by sea, by distance, but we'll all be together and in unity because we belong to the same Jesus Christ. What a people that will be. I don't know what your family life is like, but if there was no strife in my family, wow, that would be an incredible thing already. Like if just every relative that I had could be gathered together and we could all agree and love each other all the time, that would be an incredible start. But it's going to be like that with billions of people. What a great promise that is. If we lift our eyes to where God is taking us, that is an incredible fulfillment. And then when it comes to blessing, well, actually, Abraham gets a bit of a foretaste of this. At one point, God says to him, Abraham, I'm your shield, your very great reward. Really, the land and the blessing and the goats and the camels and the, the bigger family, that, that's not the blessing. God is the reward. God is the blessing. Who wants money when you can have Jesus Christ? I mean, really? When are the times you felt most fulfilled in your life? Are they not the times when you've been closest to Jesus? And one day there'll be no distance. One day we will be face to face with him. We will talk with him without any of the nagging doubts, without any of the sense of distance, without having that, oh, but I also need to confess my sin and I know I've let you down. None of that, because we'll be face to face with him forever in perfect unity. This is all the things that we're promised. Lift our eyes. This is the challenge that we have every day. Lift our eyes from the immediate and from the now and see the future. Stephen, I was trying to remember, and I, I needed to listen to the whole recording to find it. You mentioned that there was a minister of yours who was, he had this catchphrase that he would always say about, about fixing your eyes on eternity, and I thought I'd just ask you. Um, yeah, it was a guy called Ken, and he basically said, until he comes. Until he comes, exactly, yeah. So until he comes, we need to have this in our minds, until he comes, until he comes, one day God will fulfill these promises in a way that is bigger than we can possibly imagine. That's the basis for Abraham saying to Lot, you have your first pick of the land, just like we heard in that reading. He doesn't feel the need to push this thing forward himself. He trusts God. The real blessing's coming in a heavenly city. He glimpses that from a distance and he goes, Lot, you take the first pick of the land. It's a good episode in his life. Then, this is the last episode we have in our passage, we get to the story of Melchizedek. Now, there's a bit of a, a, bit of a history to this. So Lot, as we heard in the reading, goes to live near Sodom. He pitches his tents there and over time he actually goes and lives in the city um, and so sort of becomes associated with that group of people. And then there's this huge upheaval in the nations. Four kings fight against five kings. Some of them have been paying tribute to the others and they rebel and they say, we're not paying tribute anymore. And there's a big battle and the king of Sodom and the other kings around him who are allied together are defeated. And Lot is just swept up in all of this. We don't actually know whether he fought, it doesn't say, but certainly he's swept up in all of this and he is carried off into captivity along with his whole family and everything he owns. And Abraham hears about this, and he launches this rescue mission. He and 318 of his picked men chase down this army, and they liberate them, and they rescue not only Lot and his family and all their stuff, but also all the other people who've been taken captive. And they bring them back triumphantly. And at this point, this character who we've never heard of before, and don't hear about again until the book of Hebrews, more or less, There's one other reference. This chap called Melchizedek, he's the king of Salem, the king of, it means literally king of peace, but it's also associated with Jerusalem. He comes out and he lays this meal out and he blesses Abraham. And Abraham gives him a tenth of everything he has. Really interesting incident. There's obviously sort of that foretaste there of of communion, bringing out bread and wine, although actually it was a very ordinary meal at the time, but it just reminds us, doesn't it? It's just a little connection in our heads. Why does Abraham do that? Why does he give him a tenth of everything he's got? He's almost rude to the other king. So it's not just deference to a king, because he turns up back to the king of Sodom, and the king of Sodom's like, you know, give us the people, but you keep all the stuff. And he's like, no, no, you're not making me rich. God makes me rich. You can have it all. The people who came with me and fought, it's up to them if they want to keep their stuff, but no, I'm not keeping anything. It's, it's almost rude, but, and it certainly doesn't have very much deference in it. But this king of Salem, he is deferent to, and he gives this huge gift to 
But unlike the other kings, Melchizedek belongs to a kingdom that Abraham recognises. He's a priest of God Most High, it says. This is the true God. And Abraham recognises in him, I know this kingdom. This is the kingdom I belong to. His gift isn't about earning favour from God, uh, nor is it like sort of paying into a pension. I don't know if, how you've heard teaching on giving in the past, but we, we don't give to God because one day he'll give back to us more. You know, he may well do because he's loving and generous and he has far more at his disposal than us, but Abraham isn't paying into a pension pot. He's giving to somebody who is greater in the same kingdom as him. When you pay your taxes, which obviously we all do without gritted teeth, with as generous a heart as we can, um, they're used to make our kingdom work, aren't they? Hospitals, education, defence, rubbish services, social care, whatever it might be. We don't pay our taxes to the French government or to the Azerbaijani government because we don't live there. We're not citizens of that. But we pay it to the authorities in our kingdom. Abraham recognises in Melchizedek, this is somebody who's greater in my kingdom. It's the kingdom he belongs to. And I want to suggest this is the third battle we have because... We prayed earlier, your kingdom come, your will be done. And of course, it is God's kingdom. He is the king of it. But it's also our kingdom. It says your kingdom or our kingdom on it. If we take the scriptures seriously, they say that we are co-heirs with Christ. God intends to give us all good things along with Christ. And sometimes... I find in myself, and I I suspect this is not just me, sometimes I know that God wants me to do something and I don't really want to do it, or he wants me not to do something, and I really want to, and there's this tussle of like, oh God, I have to do this for you. I'm just being honest, I'd, I'd love it, it wasn't that case, but sometimes it is, because I'm not getting this. The fact is, it's my kingdom, it's not that I'm sort of giving up something of mine so that God can have his kingdom, this is, this is the kingdom that I am part of in which God is king and I'm a subject and one day I'm going to be an heir (laughs) along with Christ and inherit it. And if we can change that mindset, then anything in us that is grudging, anything in us that, that doesn't really want to give to God what he's asking, just disappears, doesn't it? Because actually this is, this is my kingdom. (laughs) This is the kingdom that I'm part of and I'm proud to be part of and whatever I can give and do and be and not do and give up, in order to see that kingdom grow. Well, of course, it's, it's, it's the kingdom that I'm in. And I want it to grow, and I want it to succeed. I want, wonder if it just helps to think about this. Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, okay, Wonka's Factory. Imagine that you're told that you have a day to go around Wonka's Chocolate Factory, and you can take anything you want. You can imagine you might sort of fill up a big hopper and just go around, like, grabbing everything you can. But then imagine you're Charlie Bucket, and he says to you, The whole factory's yours. Suddenly it doesn't become a mad rush to get everything you can, does it? You you want the factory to succeed and you make decisions that are good for the factory and you don't go, oh, well, I suppose I'm not going to take that much because it'll cost me money. You you, you want the factory to succeed because it's yours. And the point is that God has given us the kingdom. Jesus reiterates this. He says to his disciples at one point, don't be afraid, little flock. It's pleased the Father to give you the kingdom. So we don't have to just sort of try and scrape all we can out of this life while living by God's rules. We get to be part of growing God's kingdom and investing in God's kingdom so that his glory increases, so that he is more honoured and we just get to live in shared glory. That's the promise we have. Romans 8 says that we are co-heirs with Christ if we share in his suffering so that we might also share in his glory. This is really poignant in the uh, parable of the prodigal son, which a number of people have made a case for saying is is really pretty much the parable of the older brother as well. I suspect you know the story. So when the lost son returns, the older brother is there and he has a bit of a, a hissy fit, doesn't he? He stands outside. He won't even go into the party. He dishonors his father in the process. His father comes out and pleads with him, which he shouldn't have to do. And he turns to his father and he says, all these years I've slaved for you and you've never even given me a goat to share with my friends. And yet this son comes back and you throw a big party for him and kill the fatted calf. What does the father say to him? He says, you don't get it. My son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. 
but we had to celebrate, didn't we? Here's the thing, God probably doesn't want to give you a goat, whatever that looks like in your life. Like you, you might get blessings in this life because God is good and generous, but he's not interested in the goat. He's interested in giving us the kingdom. Just like that father wasn't interested in killing a goat so that he could have a feast with his friends. He was interested in giving him everything he had. This is a mind shift, a mindset shift that we need. This is our kingdom. God's the king, but it's our kingdom. So how do we respond to this? How do we fight these three battles? I want to suggest three quite radical responses to these. Because they are battles, they're not games. They're battles that we face. So we've got to, got to tackle them with a bit of gusto. Um, the first one's this. Caroline, can you put that photo up on screen for a sec? My older sister, Gub, is, uh, she's afraid of heights. And this is what she decided to do about it. She decided to take up climbing. And 10, 12 years later, that's a genuine photo. That's her climbing an overhang well above the skyline level of the, of the city. Um, and that's not the craziest thing she's done. She climbed a place called Point Perpendicular, which is exactly what it sounds like. Rises out of the sea just like that. And it's a sort of several hundred foot drop into the sea if you lose your footing. She decided that she was going to put her in a situation, herself in a situation where she could not live in fear. And she took up climbing. I want to suggest that if we struggle with this fear or faith battle, if we find ourselves living out of fear, inhibited in doing what we know God would like us to do because we're afraid, making decisions based on what we fear might happen rather than how we feel God is leading us. Why not choose to put yourself in a position where fear is not an option, where you have to trust? Is your fear running out of money? For some people I know who've had this, they've chosen to give away savings or the comfort money, you know, the difference between what you actually earn and what you actually need to make it through the month, which, which equates to luxury or savings. Some people have chosen to just give that away. Because this way I know that I'm leaning on God and I'm not living out of fear for my finances. Or is it fear of losing face? Tim spoke about um, how he started seeing his name put up next to CU events and there was that risk of reputational loss. What is that for you? If you're afraid of losing face in front of people, what would it be like to determine that for the whole of this week, any time I see anybody upset or sick, I will offer to pray for them? It puts you in a place, doesn't it, where you can't live out of fear. You have to live in trust. That's a really good way to tackle this fear or faith. We need to overcome the fears in us that inhibit us from glorifying God. What about this one here? Our eyes too much fixed on the now. In some ways, it's similar to the last, but take stock of what's occupying your thoughts during the day and choose to set it aside. One place that I saw this powerfully at work, actually, is people who've chosen to take a year of singleness. Um, a number of people ahead of a gap year, sometimes as a student, have said, my mind is just constantly kind of, you know, oh, might I start a relationship with that person? Or I really like that person. What should I do about it? And they've said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a decision this year. I am not going to start a relationship. And as a result, they've had that chance to just focus on what really matters on eternity, just without that distraction it's been a conscious choice. Now, it does come with risks. It comes with a risk that, you know, you might meet somebody you really like and not be at liberty to start something. But do you know what? Their eyes are set on something greater. <clears throat> Take note of the prayers that we're praying. What are we praying for? We're praying for health. I notice in our home group, all of us, and m myself as much as anybody else, a lot of the things that we're carrying are the health of people around us, that we, you know, our relatives or our friends. And it's a good thing to pray for. But if that's all we find ourselves praying for, how do we lift our eyes? Well, what would it be like instead to make it our regular prayer habit to read through Revelation 20 and 21 and to ask God to show us more of what he's leading us into, that future glory? That would be quite a prayer habit, wouldn't it? To set our eyes on eternity, to set our eyes on things unseen. And then what about this one about your kingdom or our kingdom? Do we really see God's kingdom as the one that we're part of? I want to suggest here generosity is the key. 
uh, there was a Christian organization that I used to need to work alongside that I really struggled with for a number of years. Um, we clashed heads. We had very different ways of working. Um, we ended up, when we should have been allies, we ended up sometimes at loggerheads. And God challenged me on it. And the way that I ended up dealing with that, my phone contract came to an end. And rather than get a new phone on contract, I thought that gives me £20 a month free. And I started giving that to this organization. I was like, we should be on the same team. So I'm going to act as though we are on the same team. God changed my heart totally through that. What we do in terms of, not, I'm not just talking financially, but how we give our time, how we give our obedience willingly, really makes a difference to our heart. So if we find there are things in our lives which we resent, I would really like to be able to do that. I just know it's not Christian. Or God's on my case about being more um, on the front foot, about witnessing at work, and I really don't want to. What does it look like to go, okay, change of heart. I'm going to seek to be as generous as I can towards God in this way. I'm going to take every opportunity that I get at work. It's just a you know, decision I'm taking in advance and I'm going to do it. Or whatever it might be. What does it look like to change that mindset from I really struggle to give to God here to I'm going to be as generous as I can. just want to land by bringing it back to the beginning. God deserves this glory. He will be glorified through our lives. But I really don't want it in my life to be because I've failed and I've messed up and God's grace is you know, the thing that's glorified. I want it to be because in my weakness, he's strong. And I want it to be because whatever status he gives me, I use to lift him higher. And I want to commend to us that that should be our heart as well. So let's fight these battles. Um, let's seek to win. Let's do whatever it takes to win those battles. And let's bring God glory as best we can, just as Abraham did. Shall we pray? God, to this day, Abraham's name brings glory to you. The stories we read, whether he succeeds or fails in being faithful to you, you are faithful and your faithfulness shines through and you're glorified. God, we long for our lives to point to your glory and we pray that you would help us to do that consciously and by choice rather than through our failure. But God, may our lives glorify you, we pray. Amen.